Well, um, I would uh, be glad to uh, discuss any questions that may have arisen in connection with the problem, too, if you would allow me to. I hadn't intended to do that. But um, <coughs> some See where I put my solution. I beg your pardon? You are in the rest of this course. I know, but in the industry, Well, you might. It depends on what kind of work you get into. I can't predict it. But uh, I, I'm, uh, as I indicated at the end of the last period, our purpose of going into this is to provide a ba basis by which you can understand the process of distillation. I think that the usual way of analyzing it is not possible without understanding a <coughs> measurement on a mole basis. On a pound mole basis. Well, pound mole basis, okay. gram mole basis, either one. <laughs> That's the purpose of it. Uh, can't even find my solution to that problem right yet here. Hang on. Yes, here it is. <clears throat> so I, I, I was going to have you turn them in, turn in the both sets this morning, uh, but um, um, and I will, but ask you to do that. But uh, might ask what answer you got for. Parts of problem two. Uh, part two. What'd you get for part A? 0.0342 mole fraction. Everybody agree with that? That's close enough. That's close enough, huh? All right. Part B asks the pound moles of feed per hour. Anybody volunteer the answer to that? 32.50 pound moles per hour. I'll accept that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how many disagree with it? How many are we just go By a factor of 10, I mean by a factor of 10 or by 10? By 10, I'm down to Well, I guess that's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, part C, which is pound moles of product with if 98% of the alcohol is recovered at 168 proof? Who has the answer to that part? <laughs> no one? 186.6. Okay, that's a good answer. 186.4 I had. How many got that answer? Well, that's pretty good. Then. Okay. How many wine gallons of the product? At 168 proof. What'd you get? Hmm? Okay, 902, is that a agreed upon answer? All right, I'm, I accept that. And how many, then so the proof gallons would uh, naturally have to be um, more or less than that? How much? 15, 16, okay. I think everybody, unless somebody has some specific questions. Look out that last part. You got to write it on the pound bowls for whatever set proof for the wine. You mean, you mean uh, the, the solution to part C? D. Well, the easiest way to do it is on uh, is to work it on a volume basis, because uh, uh, 
um, everything is previously stated in volume, and the answer is actually the volume measure. <coughs> volume measure, so uh, the easiest part is just to work it on a, on a volume basis. So this would be part D, using a volume basis. We'd had a, <clears throat> and writing in an alcohol balance. We have 7,500 gallons per hour multiplied by <clears throat> the percent alcohol by volume and it's 0 0.1031 on a fractional basis 10.31 percent and again 98 percent of it is recovered when we say 98% is recovered, why well, it doesn't make, doesn't make any difference what basis we say. That's a, that's a fact that it's either on of gallons or pounds or pound moles, whatever basis. So this would be the gallon. This would be the gallons of uh, the wine times the percentage of alcohol would be the gallons of alcohol, and uh, multiplying with this factor 98 in order to count adjust to the recovery times the number of wine gallons times the percent alcohol in the wine gallons, which is 0 0.84 as a fractional percentage. And so you simply solve that through for uh, the wine gallons is equal to 7,500 times 0 0.1031 times 0.98 divided by 0.84 equals 902.1 wine gallons per hour. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now I'd like to have you to assign one more problem, which is a little more difficult, and is a, is a better example of, um, take one of those and pass it along, uh, a little more realistic example of um, of a practical <clears throat> situation as far as um, writing a mass balance. This is a, ma this is a mass balance on this one. You don't really need to use mole balance, uh, mole percentages, as, you, as you'll see. So I ask you to hand that in on next Tuesday. You don't have to have it tomorrow, but next Tuesday. Now I thought I would take a um, period this morning to be to review with you uh, some of the considerations of, of uh, having to do with some of the fundamental things we need to have uh, to understand um, distillation processes, that is particularly the um, vapor-liquid equilibria relationships that pertain in solution mixtures. So I first want to remind you that we define distillation as a vaporizational process for the purpose of separating components of a mixture, utilizing differences in vapor pressures of the components. That's one way of saying it. The way I said it the other day may be slightly different, but it means the same thing. Take advantage of the difference in vapor pressures of the components of a mixture to produce a partial or a complete separation by putting it through a vaporizational process, creating a vapor and uh, condensing that vapor to make a liquid. <clears throat> now we use the term vapor pressure. So let's uh, think for a minute now, what do we mean when we talk about vapor pressure? What does vapor pressure mean? 
Well, there's probably various definitions of that too, but I like to say that it's a measure of the number of molecules of a given species or component of a vapor or gas in a given volume or space. And you can think of it as the result of the energy, the molecular energy of motion of the molecules. You can even think of it as the impact of the molecules colliding with the walls of a vessel and they're by producing the pressure on the walls of the vessel, if you want to think of it that way. <clears throat> and uh, the more molecules they have in the vapor space, the higher the pressure. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we, uh, Avogadro's number tells us that we have, uh, what is it, 606 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of a gas in 22 and 4 tenths liters. We have, an, uh, we have 760 millimeters of pressure, or one atmosphere. I think I, remember, I think that I learned that about 40 years ago, and I, I think it's still correct, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, anyway, uh, in a given particular volume, whether it's a milliliter or a liter or a cubic foot, if you could really measure the number of actual molecules, you'd have a measure of the vapor pressure. Anyway. <clears throat> The vapor pressure of a pure compound is um, a function of the temperature. As we increase the temperature, the pressure increases. We increase the energy by, by applying, if we in, add energy, and thereby raise the temperature. And let's say at a particular temperature, such as <coughs> atmospheric, at a particular pressure, such as atmospheric, where the molecules move faster and the pressure goes up increases. As a matter of fact, all we have to do to specify the vapor pressure is, is to specify the temperature or vice versa. If we say that <clears throat> we're talking about a pure compound and we, uh, we have a certain temperature we want to consider, well, we can go to the, the literature, uh, reference books, and find what the vapor pressure is. It's a specific property of the, co of the compound. Or conversely, uh, you can do it the other way around. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> this is also um, maybe a good time to mention that <clears throat> this is just a this can be, uh, this is a good example of the application of the Gibbs phase rule. Which says that the number of degrees of freedom in, <clears throat> in a system is equal to the number of the components plus two minus the degree of phases. C is equal to components. P is equal to phases, number of phases, <clears throat> and F is would be the number of degrees of freedom or the number of f variables that, that um, are not specified or fixed. Now, when we're talking about a pure, compo pure compound, and, um, and <clears throat> a, let's say we have a, start with a, a liquid in a closed vessel. I'm trying to draw it. <clears throat> and so we have a material here that has um, some <clears throat> has species of molecule in the liquid phase. And uh, at any particular temperature, the motion of these molecules will call will cause them to escape into the into the into this, let's say, a void up here initially, a complete vacuum, 
and uh, and they'll continue to escape, and then they'll begin to in, in the vapor or in this gaseous phase that <coughs> the molecules move and uh, collide with each other, and sometimes they collide with the liquid, and so eventually you'll have a state at which the rate of escape from the liquid is exactly equal to the rate at which you're captured again by the liquid or returned to the liquid. And so we, we speak of that as being at equilibrium. So in other words, <clears throat> when we have attained equilibrium between the liquid phase and the vapor phase, well, then we have, then the number of molecules in this vapor phase is a measure of the vapor pressure. The number of molecules per unit volume is a measure of the vapor pressure. So as I st started to say here, if you're, when we're talking about a pure component, if we're talking about a pure component, <coughs> <coughs> well, then C is one, so, and uh, for a pure component and uh, for two phases, and, and vapor and liquid in equilibrium. Why well, then we have <coughs> number of components is one plus two, and the number of phases would be two minus two, so one. So that merely just sa says that you have one degree of freedom if you specify temperature. Why the system is fixed. If you specify pressure, the system is fixed. If you specify, well, that's it. <laughs> That'd be it. <clears throat> but now we're more concerned with mixtures. And uh, <clears throat> so we use a term partial vapor pressure when we're talking about the pressure that's contributed by one component of a mixture. No, but just as I said, <clears throat> partial vapor pressure then is that fraction of the total pressure which is contributed by one molecular species. Or that is one component or one compound of a mixture. <clears throat> and so, uh, so we can <clears throat> extend our concept here for mixtures or solutions. Take a little crude diagram again and uh, indicate that we have a liquid phase down here and a, and a gaseous phase above. And so we'll just arbitrarily say that one component is represented by the <coughs> circles, and another component in here of a different species is uh, represented by the <coughs> squares in this diagram and of course at equilibrium there'll be a certain percentage of the there'll be a certain number of gaseous molecules up here and a certain number of um, I mean there'd be <coughs> certain numbers of one com of the component represented by the circles as well as those represented by the squares and so at equilibrium you will have <coughs> again a um, certain ratio between the one compound, the number of molecules of one compound to that of the other, but it'll not be the same as it was in the mixture because they will have had different vapor pressures. <coughs> so, uh, we'll go, but anyway, the term partial vapor pressure. Is that portion <clears throat> the total the total pressure contributed by one component or one compound whichever <clears throat> now at this point I think it'd be convenient to um, write down a set of standard symbols that, use, that we'll use and they're usually used in books because we have a few mathematical relationships we want to develop here. 
So first I'll write down a list of symbols. <clears throat> and uh, although there's some variation between different sources and how this is done, why uh, I'll, I'll use the, the word letter A to represent uh, one component of a mixture. <clears throat> Some books might use either different letters or they sometimes use one, two, and three, but we'll use A for one and B for another. And C for another, and so on, to as many as there are. Most times we'll be, we'll be talking about binary solutions, so it'll just be A and B. <clears throat> now, the term capital P, capital P with um, subscript A and usually written with a superscript zero represents there's a symbol representing the vapor pressure of a compound in the pure state. In other words, it's the vapor pressure A component A. Well, I better put in pure component A. All right. We <clears throat> similarly we have piece of B would be the vapor pressure of pure component B. <clears throat> and then we also have then we also use a small p letter P with subscript A to represent the partial pressure. Of component A. <clears throat> and so similarly, a piece of B would be partial pressure of component B. And P represents the total pressure, total pressure of the system. And P is the sum of the partial pressures of the individual components. So we can immediately write that uh, <clears throat> we can immediately write that P is equal to P sub A plus P sub B if it's a binary solution, or if it's a ternary, it'd be P sub C plus however many components there are. <clears throat> And just a couple more symbols, and then we'll go on <clears throat> some another aspect. Of it. We use a symbol small x with subscript A <clears throat> to represent the, the the composition and expressed in mole fraction of component A. So in the liquid phase, so x sub A would be the mole fraction. <clears throat> of A in the liquid phase. And of course, X sub B <clears throat> would be the mole fraction of, of uh, component B in the, in, the <clears throat> in the liquid phase. Then we use the symbol Y for the composition in the vapor phase. Mole fraction <clears throat> of A in the vapor phase. And similarly, Y sub B, B in the vapor phase. <clears throat> well, I think now <clears throat> we can consider what <clears throat> might be the result under a certain set of um, circumstances, such as uh, what we call an ideal solution. If we have, <clears throat> if we had a 
mixture here represented by these two species in which there is no real interaction between the molecules and they were so they don't <clears throat> um, have an energy relationship between the molecules in liquid phase and that they're sufficiently dispersed in the, in the vapor phase so that there's no particular interaction between them. Well, we have what we call an ideal solution. <clears throat> and quantitatively, an ideal solution says that, <clears throat> says that the partial pressure Produced or contributed by one component, such as A, is equal is proportional to the amount present times its vapor pressure in the pure state. In other words, that's merely saying that if you have a pure component, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you had a solution which was 50%, let's say, of one component, why well, that the vapor pressure contributed by that would be 50% of the total pressure produced. <coughs> Or in other words, it'd be the partial pressure <clears throat> would be 50% of its pure vapor pressure state. Now, <clears throat> I think it might be useful, worthwhile to um, incidentally, this statement, this this expression here is a, is a mathematical expression of, of Raoult's law, called Raoult's law. And it applies to, um, uh, it would be a, an application of, a, or would apply to pure, to, a ideal, to a, an ideal solution. <coughs> now, if we want to plot the vapor pressure versus concentration in a mixture, of an ideal mixture, so we plot x sub a here on the horizontal, and that'll be from 0 to 1. And of course, if this is a mixture, why x of a binary mixture, x sub b will be the, be the difference between that and 1. It'll be from 0 to 1 <coughs> in this direction. We know that Component A will have a certain vapor pressure in the pure state or it's, when it's one out here. P sub A superscript zero. And if Raoult laws if Raoult's law apply, <clears throat> that is its vapor pressure is proportional to the concentration, it'll simply be a straight line relationship from zero up to P sub A. So we can label that line P sub A partial pressure of A in the solution. Similarly, pure component B over on this side would have some <clears throat> vapor pressure in the pure state, which we can indicate P sub B, superscript zero. And, uh, and uh, if Raoult's law also applies, if it's an ideal solution, well, this line here would represent the partial pressure of component B then the total pressure of the system would be the sum of these partial pressures, P sub A plus P sub B, and that'll be a straight line connected like this. So this would be the total pressure of the system, which is P sub A plus P sub B. <clears throat> well, now that would be the situation if we had a, an ideal solution. It was ideal throughout its, uh, the range of composition, but uh, there are really are very few examples. There are some mixtures that approach this state, and some that can consider to be um, um, behave as ideal solutions and over a limited range, usually at the ends of the composition diagram there. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, <clears throat> It is said that, or it's true that um, this relationship here is essentially correct 
when x sub a, as x sub a approaches 1 is the limit. In other words, when uh, you're approaching the purest compound, well, then uh, this is mathematically very close. <clears throat> In other words, this says, this says then that <clears throat> most many com many compounds observe this when they're present in the as the major component, essentially 100 percent. So therefore, it said to apply to the solvent. It said to apply to the solvent. <coughs> In other words, we have if we have a dilute solution, one if we have a dilute solution of some compound in a in a, another in a which is in large amount we we speak of the one that's in small amount as being the solute and the large amount as a solvent don't we and so this applies to the solvent <coughs> well in, re, in if we plot um, The situation, the more realistically and more typical of a binary solution, which is all, uh, and we're still talking about binary solutions in which it's a homogeneous solution, they're <coughs> mutually soluble. This would be ideal here. Now I draw one that's more typical, a realistic situation where again we plot x sub a from zero to one against vapor pressure <clears throat> and so of course still we'd have uh, over here it'd be the value of the pure, pure vapor pressure of component A but the vapor pressure would be instead of being a straight line like that it's more likely to be sort of high straight up, goes straight here for a short distance and curves off and then tends to come in here at tangent to the to that. So this is partial pressure of component A. What this says is that right here in dilute solutions it has a has a straight line relationship which is indicated by <coughs> often referred to or described by Henry's law. <coughs> which says that the partial pressure component A in dilute solution is, is proportional to the concentration, but the proportionality concentration is not the vapor pressure. In fact, the, the K is usually a lot higher. K here replaces uh, <clears throat> the uh, pure pressure of uh, value um, as a proportionality constant. <clears throat> and typically, K is much larger than, K is much larger than, than uh, P. So what happens is, so what happens is that down here in very dilute solutions, and this, this is said to apply to dilute solutions or to the solute. So if you want to think of it this way, if this represents the behavior component A, in this region here where you have a, essentially a straight line up to maybe a percent or something like that, or Henry's law applies. So P sub A is equal to some constant times x of a, this would be Henry's constant, or k is Henry's constant. <clears throat> and over here, where it tends to come in, I didn't maybe draw that quite right, but it tends to come in tangent here, this part here would be where the partial pressure is given by x of a, the p sub a zero, or in other words, Raoult's law would apply. <clears throat> Of course, if the same situation applies to component B, instead of having, if this is partial pressure component B, I mean the total pressure of pure, pure pressure of B, 
we, instead of having a straight line as before, it would have, it would have some similar behavior, something like that. <clears throat> And the total pressure in this case then is going to be not a straight line across here because these values are greater than the diagonal. If, if they, if they, if this, in this case, they add up to be a straight line. Since this case, both curves are above the diagonal, typically the vapor pressure is somewhat larger than it would be predicted in ideal solution. Then the total pressure is going to be somewhat larger and it's usually a curve in this shape here. I never can remember where you say that's convex or concave. I guess it's concave with respect to the axis in it. Yeah. <laughs> so that'd be typical. That'd be a more typical situation here. Well, this um, leads us into. Uh, <clears throat> What we might, uh, what we may have more use for, and that is the, <coughs> instead of plot of the pressure versus composition, these would, of course, would apply for a particular temperature. These, well, these curves here would be, or for T, it's a constant, for T constant. <coughs> Some different temperature, well, then the, the shape might be the same, but numerically they'd have different, be different values. <coughs> now, of course, what happens uh, if we want to consider the relationship between pressure and um, and temperature bo of, of, of boiling, of the boiling point? Now, a very simple <coughs> elementary consideration. You know that uh, what is the boiling point? What is it? The temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the, a the atmospheric pressure. That is a, generally that's what um, we're talking about. <clears throat> or maybe a more general term would be the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the system equals the system pressure. Because we can have systems that are not at atmospheric pressure. We can have a vacuum low pressures or we can have high pressures but and so then the the boiling point would be different but it'd be um, anyway the temperature at which we have sufficient energy of applied to cause the continuous production of the vapor phase conversion of the liquid into the vapor phase so in other words um if we have two compounds, like let's say water in a pure state, it takes a certain amount of energy and a certain amount, a certain temperature, namely 100 degrees centigrade or 12 degrees Fahrenheit, to uh, raise it up to the boiling point, doesn't it? Ethyl alcohol has a boiling point of um, 78.32 degrees centigrade in its pure state. Therefore, considerably less than water. So, what does this say? In a pure state, it certainly has a higher vapor pressure, doesn't it? Because it, at any at any particular temperature, so it's it's basically more volatile than the ethyl alcohol. In other words, <clears throat> if we if we can if we compare water and alcohol as a function of temperature. It's pretty obvious that alcohol is going to have a higher vapor pressure at most any temperature you take because it's going to reach the boiling point sooner. So it had to have a higher vapor pressure when it got near the boiling point at least. And generally speaking, it has a higher vapor pressure over the whole range. <clears throat> so considering our mixtures again, typical mixture here, if we had this component and raised it up to the boiling point, this component B, it would have a certain, uh, it would have a certain uh, <coughs> boiling point. <coughs> and let's let's just con 
schematically consider now what the temperature would be versus composition for something represented by this typical situation where this represents composition on the horizontal axis and the temperature here. <clears throat> well, if we consider this compound B, which has a lower vapor pressure at the, at the pure state than, uh, than A, it will have some, it'll have a higher boiling point. So we can put it, we can put up here uh, temperatures T sub B superscript to represent the boiling point in the pure state. And if compound A has a higher vapor pressure, well, it's going to have a lower boiling point in a pure state. So it'll have some value over here about, which we might call, um, which T sub A superscript. <clears throat> and so now, what happens if we take mixtures? Well, this curve would suggest here that since the uh, vapor pressure of a mixture is somewhat higher than 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 the than, it would, than the um, additive values would be for an ideal mixture, that that it's going to boil at a somewhat lower temperature than you would have predicted if you just drew a straight line average across there, and that's what happens. <clears throat> In other words, instead of having a straight line, we typically get a curve that's um, convex toward the axis, <clears throat> or the reverse of the pressure curve. Well, uh, <clears throat> Perhaps it'd be just as well now to mention that this would be <clears throat> what we we can that we can take a mixture experimentally and take it into the laboratory in a proper de device and bring it up <clears throat> knowing the composition exactly or we measure the composition or something we can measure the composition we can determine the boiling point. <clears throat> We, ha we can also extract the sample of that vapor of suitable equipment and determine its composition. And it will be different than the liquid, naturally, if, if, the, if they have a <clears throat> different vapor pressures. And so we can take um, these values and plot them on a curve, and we'll find that they have a they'll have produce a curve that's usually typically something like this. So we call this a vapor curve, usually labeled as a V. And this is a liquid, the boiling point of the liquid. <clears throat> so we have now what we ha we have now what we call a, a phase diagram. It's a phase diagram or a boiling point composition diagram. And it says, in effect, that <clears throat> whenever you take any mixture out here of indicated or represented by uh, some value of X sub A, that if you increase the temperature by applying heat energy, uh, this is all one liquid phase out here. When we finally reach this temperature here, we <clears throat> get the first appearance of vapor. And, and so, uh, if we continue to add heat, we, we do not increase the temperature, but we merely create vapor at that same temperature. And the curve says that the vapor that comes off is given by the drawing a line straight across to the vapor line. So we have here what we call the boiling point composition diagram, and uh, <clears throat> it's a very useful concept to represent um, vapor-liquid equilibrium. So I think I'll...
leave you by handing out here a, sort of a practical vapor liquid composition diagram that for ethyl alcohol and water plotted in terms of um, percent alcohol by proof proof now this particular drawing is more is kind of useful as a kind of an operational guide when you're operating or doing distilling but in practice uh, we don't use volume percent basis for for calculations but it's very useful there should be enough of those Oh, pass them back. Pass them back to, <coughs> to everybody gets them. <coughs> and then uh, next time we'll uh, we'll discuss uh, the other way of representing this data, that, that namely the vapor liquid equilibrium curve, where instead of in introducing the temperature term, we can relate the liquid composition to the vapor temperature, and that's usually what we want to know. Not, I don't mean the temperature, the vapor composition. The li we relate the liquid composition to the vapor composition. And we call that the equilibrium curve. And that's the one that's more useful for calculation purposes. Right over here with pure water. And if it goes across more and more out, all is added to the mix. And that's right. The one I handed out shows that the boiling point of pure water on the left is 100 degrees centigrade, or 212 Fahrenheit, I guess it says. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, as you go across here in percent alcohol by volume, you have the boiling point curve here, the liquid curve, and the corresponding vapor curve. Note that down here at about 95, uh, as near as we can represent it, 96%, uh, that the lines come together so that there's no difference. That represents what I mentioned yesterday is the azeotrope for constant boiling mixture. And for convenience, we put the boiling point in degrees centigrade on the right hand side. Do you have another question? Do you have a question? Someone? Yeah, the line that you drew uh, parallel to the x-axis that intersects the vapor curve, does that tell you how much, um, what the mole fraction of vapor is then? At In equilibrium, yes. It would be the, I this isn't a very good curve, but it's a, this would be, <clears throat> if we have, if we have x of a, and then we call that one, for example, why well, this gives this composition here, and this would be y sub a sub one. In other words, it'd be the composition of the vapor in equilibrium with that liquid. And um, that's usually what we want to know. So I didn't quite finish. So uh, what I'm trying to say, this this is an indication of phases here. This area below the curve represents all liquid phase or one phase. Any point in the, between the two curves represents a mixture of vapor and liquid, so it's a two phases. And if you had a point represented up here, it'd be all gaseous phase or one phase gaseous. It would mean, of course, that you were able to take this vapor here and add heat to it and be a, what would be called a superheated vapor if you, if you were the, if you're, if you had a point that fell at that point above this curve. <clears throat> Normally we don't run into that uh, in situation except in the, well, power generation, steam, we do, we use superheat, things like that. <clears throat> well, that's all for this morning. Now, we, we, uh,